So we have a number of talks tonight, and we're going to hear about social networks, we're going to hear about cryptography, we're going to hear about teaching science through cartoons, but we're also going to hear about a fictional planetary system. And please welcome Matt Webb. Of course, of course, as we all know, the Earth is hollow, uh, and down there there are these enormous caves. And in these caves, it's not dark, actually, because the crust of the Earth kind of pushes down and the pressure makes the air fluoresce. And by that fluorescent air, you can see these enormous oceans, and as well as these oceans, these mushrooms, which are 50 or 60 feet tall. That's science fiction, uh, but there's some uh, factual uh, speculation that there is life down there, and that's what generates fossil fuels, uh, not lossy, compressed jungles a billion years old at all. So I kind of like science that sounds like science fiction. Another example is Earth's second moon, Charithne, which doesn't orbit the Earth, but orbits a kind of a balance point between the Earth and the Sun, and so has an orbit kind of shaped like a kidney, which is just nice because it's a cool shape. I'm also a fan, as well as science that sounds like science fiction, of moving cities. Uh, so I like Kim Stanley Robinson's description of a city on Mercury, which is on giant train tracks, which heat up as the Sun goes around the planet, uh, and as they heat, they expand, and that pushes the city onwards and onwards and onwards, round and round the equator. Another moving city I like uh, that I've heard about is a birdhouse. Uh, and this birdhouse is actually meant to walk around because when the birds land on the struts inside, uh, it, it mechanically pushes the building forwards, so it roams around the landscape like a giant robot. Now, there's actually an aviary at London Zoo, which, which, which is based on this, but it doesn't walk around, I'm afraid. Um, I was talking about Mercury just now. I mean, the really neat thing about Mercury is that its orbit doesn't obey Newton's uh, laws of gravitation. Uh, in fact, it wasn't until Einstein came along with this general relativity uh, that we found out why the orbit worked like it did at all. Uh, before that, people speculated there was another planet inside the orbit of Mercury, uh, and the name they gave to that planet was Vulcan. So now you know. Another speculated planet there is, uh, is something the Greeks said, which is kind of Earth's evil twin, where everything is just like us, but really, really bad. And they placed this planet in the exact same orbit as the Earth, but on the other side of the sun, uh, so we couldn't see it. Which is really nice from a kind of a symmetry perspective, but it turns out it's actually gravitationally unstable. Here's another one. Uh, this is the planet that was supposed to be the origin of the asteroid belt and kind of blew up a billion years ago. Uh, that's wrong because the asteroid belt is actually left over from the accretion disk, which was meant to, uh, which is the thing which the solar system came from all those billions of years ago. And another planet is uh, Herod. I was reading this book by Michael Moorcock where he talks about Venus and uh, Mercury, and then he goes, Herod. And I'm like, as a young kid, I'm like, Herod? There's no planet called Herod. There are nine planets. You can't go around making planets up. That's science, right? It's a fact. Uh, except now there are only eight planets, and it turns out that Pluto is just a social construction three billion miles away. And there's a tenth planet which looks like a character encoding bug, not a planet at all. Okay, so we need some uh, real planets now, I think. Uh, the first one is Uranus, which doesn't need science fiction to make it cool because it doesn't orbit like this like all the other planets, but it orbits on its side with its north pole always pointing towards the galactic center like a giant compass for the solar system. Uh, that's Uranus. And on Jupiter, what you're going to find is you're going to find these artificial intelligence that live in uh, smart matter that live thousands of times faster than we do, and we can watch their civilizations growing and falling and fighting, and the patterns they make look like weather. Uh, that's in Ken McLeod's Cassini division. And in Saturn, we'll find the space spiders, uh, who actually live in the, uh, the disk, not Saturn, and they live in the disk because that's kind of like the accretion disk where they live to begin with. And these guys, they're trying to blow up the solar system to make it go back to the accretion disk, which is where they really liked it because that was home. So they're bad guys, but when they talk about the accretion disk, they talk about their artists who span spider webs across the, uh, across the asteroids and made beautiful colors, and their musicians who made harps across the solar system to make beautiful music. And they're bad guys, you know, but it sounds gorgeous. And the thing is that this description, the accretion disk, reminds me of nothing so much as the web, that we have a kind of an accretion disk of trillions of tiny pieces all linked together, and there's a, they, may be, they may eventually turn into eight or nine or ten humongous, boring planets. Planet Google, planet Facebook, planet <laughs> MicroWho, you know. So I kind of root for these space spiders, you know, because I identify with them. We should, be, uh, we should be carrying on making our art and our harps and our music and our links, and we should be resisting forming these humongous, boring planets. We shouldn't be accreting. We shouldn't be selling out. Okay, my last favorite planet is Neptune, which is the final home of the 14th species of man, uh, who have an eye on their head and telepathy, so they can make a planet-wide telescope just by looking up. <laughs> but also because Neptune is blue, and it's the blue of 
it's the blue of summer skies. And it's, uh, it's the blue of projectors when they don't work. And it's the blue of hyperlinks, right? It's the blue of the virtual and the potential. And it's, it's when, when our spaceships go off and we go and take over other solar systems, they'll take off into Florida skies, which are that blue. Anyway, those are the books I mentioned. Those are destinations. And I think I've got a slot to talk more about sci-fi tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow evening. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you very much, Matt. I'm sure a lot of you remember him from this keynote last year.